There are 206 bones in the human skeleton, and in death, a person's bones speak volumes about their life. We have to look at every single bone individually. And if we see an anomaly, we will look at it under the microscope. So the maximum length is 444 millimeters. Authorities know very little about this man, including who he was, or even how he came to be in Wake County. Every case is different, so it always provides a unique perspective that you have to gain from looking at the remains and there's always something different about them. 95 millimeters. Authorities also don't know who killed him, only that he died violently. It looks like we have three entrance gunshot wounds here, and this is, looks like a keyhole, so the direction would have been from superior to inferior with the bullet trajectory going this way. But forensic anthropology could be called the science of talking bones. So law enforcement authorities from communities across North Carolina turned to the forensic anthropology lab at North Carolina State University for help. They want to understand what the remains of crime victims are saying. They can tell you a lot about the person, about how they lived, about um, everything that we do during our life actually leaves a mark on our bone. So. For example, we can tell if somebody um, um, had large muscle attachment sites, so you know they were physically active and were robust or rugose, meaning heavily muscle marked. 126. The scientists give a voice to unidentified remains in more than a dozen cold cases every year. They can talk about the diseases a person may have had in life, I can talk about um, like in sort of spina bifida, what kind of um, prenatal environment they may have had, what kind of childhood they may have had, you know, if it affected their stature, if it affected their dentition, their diet, um, their, uh, sometimes even their climate, their, uh, whatever they're acclimatized in terms of altitude. Um, all of these things can be readily seen and um, interpreted sometimes. To find out where this victim was from, as well as the sex, Ross took almost three dozen measurements of the skull. The information was entered into a database called 3D ID. Dr. Ross helped develop it. The program compares the features of the cranium with those taken from people around the world. We were able to establish that he was a Hispanic male. One of the things that we looked at was the shape of the face, the shape of the nose, we digitized him and took measurements off of his skull. His measurements allocated or classified into South American. The pelvic bones also indicated the victim was a male. The femur can tell a person's height. In this case, about five feet five inches tall. That correlates with the population of Chile. Missing teeth indicate poor nutrition. An examination of the chemical composition of the bones reflects the drinking water where the man lived. And since none of the chemical signatures in the bones are found in the water in North Carolina or anywhere else in the United States, it is likely the man moved to the state less than five years before he died. DNA is also extracted from the bones when possible to add to the profile. One of the things that we look at, he has a slight spina bifida occulta, which um, you can assess that he had probably poor natal health in, um, the, during life, fuse, and that is a lot of populations that don't use folic acid, right? And we include that in all of our foods now. We have them in cereals and pasta, prenatal vitamins. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these populations, you would get those kinds of anomalies. The focus is as serious as murder but the remains are never treated as just a case number. It's important to stay grounded and remember that they were a person like you and me. You know, what's to, to make that situation different? So you have to keep that level of respect, I think. Because these bones belong to an individual, and I think about uh, how I would want my remains treated if it was in my, you know, if I was on that table instead. 
and I would hope that it would be in the same way that I would treat another individual's remains. It is challenging work. Some people might even call it gruesome. There are instruments in the lab to deal with human remains that aren't fully skeletonized. But just as every person is unique, each case is unique as well. They're all very different and you have to have very fresh eyes whenever you start a new case because you're looking for something that you, some, a lot of times that you haven't seen on another skeleton before or that you at least haven't come across very frequently. And you have to be cautious but you also have to be open. The goal is to use science to bring resolution to someone who has no voice. The information gathered from the bones will be passed on to authorities in hopes it will help identify the victim and solve a murder. You wonder what made you get to the point that you could actually do such a horrific thing to a person. Uh, the worst cases for me are the cases that are involved children. Um, so people doing horrible things to children, you know, because they, they didn't necessarily put themselves in a situation that they found themselves to be in. As whereas a grown up sometimes, hey, we make some bad choices. But with a child, they didn't have a choice. And those are, I lose sleep over those cases.